morning. My name is Richard Miller, and welcome to Never Not Here. And uh, I guess so many times I open and I say, we talk. And you do too. I mean, somehow verbalization is a human phenomenon. It's kind of hot, like how we know each other or how we share. And uh, some people are quiet, I suppose. Some people probably feel that they never really express what's important to them. Or maybe if you haven't ever expressed what's important to you, you might not even know what it is because you haven't investigated it or haven't really worked around with it. And that's the real luck that I have in my life because uh, I'm always finding people that aren't necessarily close, but they're as close as my computer. So, uh, well, let's just go for it. Uh, this morning we're, we're with David Ord, and he's uh, into publishing with Namaste Publishers. And uh, he's got uh, some wide-ranging experiences that we want to hear about. Hi, David. Hi. How are you doing this morning, Richard? Uh, fantastic. Cooling off a little bit there in Chicago? It's just perfect. You know, I almost hate to be inside, you know, because it's, it's those crispy days. And uh, I think it's about our last week of warmth, uh, good warm weather. Well, we're just having our first day of what I might call some nice fall weather. Uh, but that um, where I come from in Yorkshire, they call a nice hot summer's day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so David's in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area. Uh, so when we, uh, you know, when we speak to each other, uh, people want to know, well, I mean, is there anything that you have in your experience that would, you know, give me a few hints? Well, in my life, the movement has been away from speaking with each other, uh, which I used to do a great deal of. Whenever anything came up in my life, I always needed friends to talk it all over with, or counselors, pastors, whoever. And the direction that my life has gone in more recent years has been one very much towards uh, the quietness, the stillness of solitude in the kind of way that Eckhart Tolle talks about in his books, The Power of Now and A New Earth, and especially um, the book that's been a little bit of a sleeper, his um, book called uh, Stillness Speaks, which on the Namaste Publishing blog site um, I uh, blogged on for, well, I suppose, best part of a year, an incredible book about becoming still. And for me, stillness is where it's at. And what really brought me into stillness from the noisy mind I had of the need to talk everything over with everyone to get their opinions and then try to figure out the best course of action as opposed to the bad course of action and usually get it wrong anyway. But uh, the thing that brought me into that stillness was um, the book The Presence Process by Michael Brown, which is uh, uh, also Namaste Publishing, just as uh, The Power of Now. And um, this is the book that enabled me to do what Eckhart had uh, been talking about. It was the book that opened the door to the how. Eckhart had been telling me uh, why and what um, needed to happen. But Michael, even though Eckhart gives us many portals, many pointers, um, Michael has given us a 10-week system that enables us to actually step into present moment awareness if we're ready to do so. So if we're ready to do so, that's a, that's probably a big statement right there. But you yes. can say, well, if you're listening to Never Not Here, if you're reading some of the books from Namaste, um, there, there's something ready, right? Some readiness is there. Well, there may be a readiness there, but there may also be still a desperate seeking. And, you know, the words of Jesus uh, who said, seek. Uh, and then he went on and said, and seek and seek and seek for the rest of your life by going to a million conferences and reading uh, thousands of books. <laughs> no, he says, seek and you will find. And so I think that when we are truly seeking, when we are truly ready, we do find. And for me, that was a presence process. But today I get to answer uh, and speak on behalf of my, Michael Brown, who wrote The Presence Process, in terms of people asking questions or wanting something in an interview and so forth. And what I find is there are many who are not yet ready for The Presence Process. They are not really ready to become still yet. And uh, so they go on seeking. You know, perhaps so we don't really find. know what, you know, some, perhaps we really just don't know, uh, it never crossed our mind exactly what they're talking about, seek. I mean, uh, for instance, 
maybe somewhere it says choose God. Yes. So that's every minute, every second. Absolutely. Choose God and choose presence every second. And we're thinking, we who live in a world of concepts and think that the world is kind of fixed around us and that we have a fixed life, we're thinking that we can choose presence once and then it would just always be here as if it was another concept. But uh, when you choose life, choose God, you're always, you know, in a way, you're always aiming yourself toward toward uh, presence. And, and maybe that's just why people, I'm not saying that they're not ready. I'm just saying they, they never thought of that. You know, they thought they could just choose it once. Yes, I think often people are not choosing that. But what they're looking for is something to end some particular point of misery in their life. And so even when they do the presence process after the 10 weeks, it won't have resolved that for them, at least not fully, and for some not at all, I find, uh, because they are not actually becoming present. They're very future, goal-oriented. And what you were talking about when you talk about God, the divine presence, is about being right here, right now, fully alive in this minute, embracing everything that is happening to me, everything that's going on in my world, as it is, without trying to change it. You know, maybe uh, we can't really cho choose this moment. We can just stop choosing uh, our considerations of, uh, of later, like tomorrow. how can I improve uh, tomorrow? How can I uh, uh, avoid my fears tomorrow? And if we just stop doing that, what's left over is presence. So if we think... That would certainly be... Yeah, if we think presence is... Oh, yeah. If we think presence is something we can go get, and then we can put it in the basket and have it, uh, it's not an object. Now, Jesus makes that statement. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Take no anxious thought about the morrow or about your size or about the hair color or all of these things. He says, just, just become focused on the kingdom of God. And Michael likens the kingdom of God to presence. It's, it's recognizing that God is present in every aspect of our lives. And once that happens, all of these other things fall into place. Once we realize we're living in presence, probably, uh, uh, in a way, we started out saying there was, like, uh, we could either talk. I said, I started saying we're talking, right? And you says, well, stillness speaks. <laughs> and so then maybe that stillness, if we just live there, is always speaking and uh, talking can happen or talking doesn't have to happen. But yes. uh, what I'm saying is like, uh, okay, the presence process is a talking. Uh, uh, you and, uh, you know, Michael, and then you uh, have are sharing with us that uh, a few hints that we can, I guess, go through some processes. And uh, how does it work exactly? I mean, why does it take 10 weeks? Or, I mean, why doesn't it take 10 months? <laughs> Either one of those is a good question. <laughs> well, this is the original book of the presence process. And then since then, Michael gave me the privilege of, after he had reworked it completely, um, based on the experience of something like, I think, nine years and tens of thousands of people's feedback. Uh, then he gave me a carte blanche to edit it and to get it into a form that can really um, really speak to people if they are, if they are listening. And um, this was the book that just totally changed my life. Uh, it took me from being that person who was seeking and anxious, who was looking for something, to finally stopping looking, the search is over. You find the kingdom of God because you find the divine presence in you, but not in you as some separate entity, in you as you. There is only God. I think one of the greatest statements I ever heard a person make was nothing but God exists. Now, technically, we could argue with that statement because I would say that God doesn't exist in the sense that the word exist, as Paul Tillich points out in his systematic theology, means to stand out from. You exist. You're standing out from the background of um, whatever it is you are in your office or home as, as we talk. I exist. This microphone exists. Things exist because they stand out from the background. But God is the whole shebang. And so in that sense, God doesn't exist. You can never point to a reality and say, that is God. But once you forget about trying to objectify, image, picture God, and you, are, and you are willing to just be, well, there is nothing but God. God self-manifesting, self-expressing as the creation of which we are each individual points of light, if you like, like sunlight, an individual ray of the sun. 
You were saying that uh, this book has changed your life and that you, from uh, uh, long, long periods of uh, seeking and improving and, and working, working around with uh, what you see. Uh, but you were actually, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for a long time in the ministry, right? You were, I mean, yes. uh, so then what's happening with, uh, you know, the, the, our normal theology is not really bringing us to, uh, it, it's just as anxious as, as uh, people without theology, or what's missing in theology? It is just as anxious, and what I would say, um, in so many of our churches, the reason people are going there isn't um, so that they can be the presence of God, it's so that they can be comforted. Uh, people want solidity, certainty, answers, but they don't want themselves to be the answer in the main. They're looking for an answer out there. And so the message of Jesus has become one of, he is the savior of all of us, and that is such a total misunderstanding of the message of Jesus. Because when he used the word savior, he was not talking about this sky pilot who gets us to heaven. He was saying, I am showing you what real humanity is, what it means to be a fully functioning whole human being, which is to be, like I am, the manifestation of God in your particular form. That's the way he saves us, by introducing us to our true selves. Once we are introduced to our true selves, everything shifts. In my life, the first thing I noticed is the same thing that I totally noticed when he writes in The Power of Now about that first night when he awoke. Uh, he had come to the end of himself. He, 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 he felt like he couldn't go on anymore. And he asked the question, how can I live with myself any longer? And the, the thought occurred to him, what a strange question that was. How can I live with myself? With myself. Well, then, are there two of me? If I am with myself, are there two of me? And if there are, what if only one of them is real? And this is, of course, how he came to understand the ego, which is the false self. People think the ego is the true self. It isn't. My sense of me, myself, is a false self. Uh, the true self is when I don't even have a sense of me anymore. And that's the thing that happened to Eckhart. He found he was walking around the city, seeing everything with totally new eyes, but hardly thinking at all. I stopped thinking. There became an awareness. I became aware. I'm very aware of things, but I don't chew them over in my mind again and again and again. If we'd been doing an interview like this um, some years back, I'd have prepared and prepared. Now I, I got up, made my breakfast, and hoped I finished my breakfast in time to get to the camera here. It's a really different way of doing life. Life flows. It's fun. Wow, that's uh, that's really valuable because um, I think there's lots of good in, in churches and in the churches. And somehow, just by looking at it in a little, uh, you know, a little askew, uh, we're not really getting everything out of it that we could get. And uh, by thinking that we're going to get a one-time savior or sa salvation, and then that's finished from there. And to really, and I guess we have the feeling that it's too much work if I have to be doing the right thing all the time. Or what do we, you know, I mean, uh, we have to tell people that from our own experience that uh, it's not too much work, it's too much fun. And yeah. uh, uh, I don't know, what is the, the, the mist, you know, okay, from the, the view of the congregation, I mean, we're saying they're lazy, we're saying they're not ready, we're saying a lot of things that really is not so polite to say, but, you know, I think it's a misunderstanding somehow that, that, uh, that even in the church they can find what they need to find, you know, their own life. I think that that's very true. It's why I wrote this book, which is Namaste Publishing, like Eckhart's and Michael's, um, Your Forgotten Self, and then it has the subtitle, Mirrored in Jesus the Christ. And I have um, a statement in the beginning about how I began to learn much of this material, and much of it has come from a man who is now 93 years old. He's a monk at Downside Abbey, Catholic uh, Abbey, uh, in England near Bath, and his name is Sebastian Moore, and he's written a number of books like The Crucified Jesus is No Stranger and uh, Let This Mind Be In You, 
and um, his books, uh, Jesus, the Liberator of Desire, and, and, and several recent ones. Actually, he just came out with a new one at 93 this year. And Sebastian Moore is thoroughly steeped in the Christian tradition, yet he revolutionizes it by showing how we have betrayed, really, what Jesus was talking about. If you just take one area in which you can see this clearly, the church has taught us for 2,000 years about original sin. So the effect that that has, you were asking about the view from the pew, the effect that has on the people as they hear that they are sinners is one of feeling inferior, uh, unworthy, um, that God is this awesome being out there before whom they must grovel. And I think for 2,000 years almost, that has been a, a, a deep etching on the message of Jesus. Now, what Sebastian does with this is he says the, the doctrine of, impo of original sin is terribly important, but it doesn't mean what people think it means. You see, we think it's something that's transmitted to us through sex and that is in our genes that is flawed about us. What he is saying is it's transmitted through, to us through society, and we are born into a society in which people don't believe in themselves, don't know themselves as the divine presence, are what we would say is spiritually unconscious. And so from the moment we are born, we are then asked to conform. I am blogging right now on the, uh, each day, well, most days, on the Namaste Publishing website uh, with another of our books, if I can put my hands on it here, called Alchemy of the Heart, which is another book by Michael Brown. And this whole book is, is about how it, it's... It, it's how from day one almost we begin to betray who we are. In fact, there's the statement in Psalm 51 where David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Now that, that has been interpreted to mean there was something wrong with the sex act that led to his conception when it's not saying that. What it's saying is even back at my conception, the entire environment in which everything about me was shaped as a human being was infected by this sense that we are unworthy, that we're not good enough, that we ought to be better than we are. Um, that's the original sin of the Garden of Eden. So in other and, words, instead of uh, uh, we're the seed of Adam, or we're the DNA of Adam, or we're the blood of Adam who, who sinned, uh, we're actually the consciousness of Adam. That's what it is. And the, and the consciousness is something that's carried over through the family, through the society, through the culture, and it's something we can get out of when we awake Absolutely. to the fact that, you know, we're in a consciousness that, you know, we haven't chosen. Yeah. And that uh, Look, even uh, that uh, our prophets and our, our wise men haven't really even uh, told us that we should stay in it. Uh, they've actually told us the opposite, and we're just thinking, you know, I don't know why, when I speak to uh, Christian people, a lot of times the vo most important thing they want to do is say, say the Bible is the Word of God and the only Word of God, and all of the Bible is the Word of God. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I want to talk to you about the presence process too, but I, I want to take this, this opportunity to speak about Christianity too, because it's a lot of our roots and it's a lot of our consciousness, right? And I mean, we're yes. just saying that uh, uh, consciousness is what uh, kind of might, might be holding us back. I mean, I'm sure it's what animates us. If you go to the consciousness of the, of the symbolism of the two trees in the Garden of Eden, not a historical reality, but a symbolism, uh, you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's, um, I try to choose the good way as opposed to the wrong way. This is how most people in the world make their, dis their decisions. Their consciousness is one of the pros and cons, figuring out the best way as opposed to the wrong way, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the other is the tree of life, which is just a flow of life. Now, when, when Eve is told, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she begins to explore this tree because the serpent says, well, if you eat of this fr fruit of the tree, you will become as God is, knowing good and bad. And it's a tree to de she found that was desired to make her wise. Now, now notice what's happening in that. There is a feeling in her from what she's been told that something is lacking. She needs to be made wise, she thinks. Told by the serpent uh, or told by God? Told by the serpent. Okay. God says, don't touch that root. Don't go that way. Go the way of the tree of life. 
But the serpent says, no, you need to become wise. You need to become like God is. Well, the truth is we were created in the image and likeness of God. We already are the self-expression, the self-manifestation of God. We are God's offspring, as Paul calls us in the book of Acts. And in God, Paul says, we live and move and have our being. That means my being, your being, is an aspect, a dimension, an expression, a manifestation of the being of God. We could not be closer to God because we are God made incarnate in a process, a long evolutionary process of becoming what Jesus showed us we really are. So she gets this feeling she's got to become something. Now that's what is fundamentally the issue of original sin. And Sebastian Moore takes us to that so clearly in his books, and that's that's what I've done using his um, ideas and concepts, and he's read this book, In Your Forgotten Self. Because we look at original sin and we realize that from day one, and when God talks to Adam and Eve, and, they, and they, they've put fig leaves on themselves because now they feel a sense of less than something, shame, all of this kind of thing. They feel disgrace. They feel inferior. And God says, who told you that you were naked? So from day one, we come into a world from before, back even at our conception, where the very vibes that are coming into the mother's womb that are affecting her bloodstream and her chemistry are those of the negativity of not knowing the glorious beings we are. And we learn to think small from the beginning. And Michael's other book, Alchemy of the Heart, is all about how we learn to pretend to be false, to be the ego, not our true self. We're excited. He has a place where he talks about, you know, guests are coming. And the little kids want to jump up and down in the hall and run. Guests are coming. Guests are coming. And they're supposed to stand there when they come. Hello. How are you? <laughs> you know, we, we crush it's why Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become again like a little child. You have to become authentic. You have to become real. That's what the word humility means. It's not this pious thing. It is about being real, authentic, genuine. So how did Michael come up with this uh, presence process? I mean, is this, did he borrow things from uh, different areas and also somehow see uh, synergies and see wholeness? Uh, uh, was he uh, uh, studying uh, Eastern philosophy and, and practices and meditations and, and yogas and, uh, you know, Kriya? And uh, there's so many things that we're all trying to do, but maybe we haven't put it together or... Uh, is, does it have those things in it, or how does it work? Yeah, well, I think Michael came into the presence process in the same way most of us come into any kind of consciousness, which is through a lot of pain. <laughs> he got dragged into it, <laughs> dragged into it. Um, Michael was working in the music field in South Africa, and um, he was in music journalism. And what happened to him? him is he began to experience um, a strange illness that the cause is unknown and there is no cure for called Horton's syndrome. And for a period of about 40, 45 minutes at a time, he would have excruciating pain throughout his body. Sometimes he would drop by the roadside in, in so much pain. So he did. Michael went on a search that took him into all kinds of avenues, uh, Native American practices. He became a Native American fire chief, this kind of thing, uh, peyote, all of, all of these things. And he had, during those practices, briefly, one night he had his first experience of what it was suddenly to have all thought leave, all worries and troubles, and suddenly be crystal clear present. Then he had another experience of that. And then, living in Mexico, if I recall the story correctly for a period of time, um, in a small bay on the, on the ocean, Michael began to have come to him the process that would end his own suffering. He no longer suffers from Horton syndrome. And in healing him, then became a 10-week a, a process that anyone can follow. Now, it's not about healing. In fact, Michael doesn't even like to use the word healing. Um, 
because healing is like we're trying to get rid of something. Wholeness is about integrating everything, embracing everything. So we're not cutting and burning and chopping. We are rather integrating all of the emotion in us that has been unintegrated, left over from the original sin in which we've grown up, that disbelief in ourselves, that putting down of ourselves, that denying of ourselves that has gone on our whole life long. When we begin to integrate that emotion. Uh, we come into an integrated wholeness, and then our life changes dramatically. This is what Eckhart Tolle is talking about in The Power of Now. A new earth, stillness speaks. I had a, a really interesting experience just, um, I guess it's two weekends ago, but we had a reunion of uh, high school. <laughs> and uh, so then it was uh, kind of an old, well, it was 50 years. <laughs> All right. And uh, so then, and then there was uh, a couple dozen people there from the grade school. So that's 54 years. But uh, some of those people, most of those couple dozen, I had been in kindergarten with. So that's like 63 years ago. And so like it was a time of together of a life, you know. Yes. And it was all uh, like a retrospective on denying ourselves and denying each other. And uh, what a beautiful thing you said there, you know, that we're, uh, we're just born into denying ourselves. And, and uh, you know, that's the support we get. And uh, that's kind of like the structure, too. The way the education even is stratified, and we're only one year, and then the ones above us and the ones below us, we don't really respect them. And uh, so uh, then somehow we spent a lifetime overcoming this. <laughs> but I mean, it was a healing, but I wasn't even thinking I was sick, you know, and I don't know if I was or not. But I mean, it was a healing in the, in the sense that, uh, well, I felt the weight come off, too, you know. That, like, you integrated I, some things. I just thought that I loved all those people. And, uh, you know, here's what I thought, actually. It was kind of like I thought that we were on a, what should I call it? A crusade? No, that's a bad word. <laughs> we were on a project, you know, that our parents all moved to this one town, and then we were uh, all put into the school, and basically, because it was compulsory education, we were supposed to stra uh, de-stratify society. You know, compulsory education means that we were all supposed to kind of equalize, you know, and we did it in a, because our parents couldn't do that. I mean, they were all off on at their own work and their own jobs and stuff like that. And it was our job to do that for our year, and, and other people had the same job, you know. And I realized, you know, we did it pretty good, or we didn't do it very good at all, you know, or however it happened. But now I feel like I'm accepting more people, and I've de-stratified society. I've come to that. I've, I've come to my, the fruition of my project, you know, the, my whole education and life project, and, and trying to be uh, the United States of America, which is a melting pot. You know, we, we say that, you know, it never melted very much, but uh, I think it's melting now. You know, the whole world is kind of me uh, melting in the sense that there is an acceptance and a, and, uh, and a de-stratification. And, and, and it only seems to be happening with a, with a strong stratification, like, you know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the middle guys fall out of the equation. So anyhow, that project, uh, it's kind of like what's happening in the world. I just realized that uh, that's what we're all up to, and, uh, and somehow the, the difficulty is that, uh, it's, it feels like we're going to get fall, we're going to fall off, we're going to fall off the train, because, uh, things are moving faster and faster, and, uh, and it feels like we can't cope, and where we're going to fall off to is not really, uh, into loss and perdition, but we're going to fall off into peace and, and inclusion. Yeah, we'll fall off the horse of ego. Right. So then I think that's the, the uh, magnificent challenge of, the, of these, uh, this age. It really is. I um, was just um, allowing to arise within me uh, an awareness of the importance of the statement that you made earlier about the value of churches and Christianity and um, how people can come to truth through all of that. Most of the people who were in the New Age movement, many of them anyway, at some time have been part of Christianity and have left hurt, disenfranchised, fed up, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but New Age is lacking the very things that Christianity has 
and Christianity doesn't have the understanding that some of New Age does have. And what's really needed now is a feeding back in together of these. Just the doctrine of original sin in itself, once you, you know, so many in the New Age movement want to say, and Eckhart tackles this question directly in The Power of Now, to say, but there's nothing wrong with humans. We're just perfect as we are. And Eckhart says in, in, in The Power of Now, he says, do you mean to tell me that the species that killed 100 million of its own kind in the 20th century alone, that that's all just okay, that there's nothing wrong with that? And it, it, it's to deny that there is a flawed aspect of our evolutionary process is to really miss the fact that presence is unfolding from the Big Bang up to where it's going as a glorious finish when the daughters and sons of God are manifested in all their fullness. And the process along the way is messy. It's not that something's wrong with where we are. It's that where we are is a mess compared to where we're going. And when you're talking about the world right now, it is passing through that same mess of a time which we might call a, a paradigm shift, um, when everything suddenly begins to look differently in the same way that when we discovered that the earth goes around the sun and not the sun around the earth, it changed our full understanding of everything, a massive paradigm shift. So the, the redressing of um, these issues within Christianity, I think, can then begin to heal this division between New Age and Christianity to where we can begin to see there was a reason these old doctrines developed. They may have become distorted, but the fact is we are born into a world that doesn't raise us to our magnificence, but rather sinks us down for a while, and then within ourselves we grow and evolve, and there's nothing wrong. The, pro the, pro the process is perfect. But let's not say that the things I do in that process are all just fine and dandy. And the whole point is to learn not to do them and to become true to who I am instead of betraying myself. Now, there's another major doctrine that I think has been grossly um, distorted within Christianity and left behind completely in New Age, and that we, we need to realize there was a reason this doctrine developed, and that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And it's come to mean, I was listening to the song the other day about, um, oh, you know, you drive your Chevy to the levee and the levee is dry. And, and the, the three men he admires most, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, took the last train to the coast. Well, that's what's happened in the churches. The, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost have become like three individuals. There is this novel out that's been read by, I think, now tens of millions called The Shack. And it's got three personalities as if that's what God were. God is not three centers, three personalities. God is one reality of which all of us partake. And the doctrine of the Trinity was developed over a long period of time for people to try to, to, to grapple with how exactly does the creation interface with the divine? How are spirit and matter able to interface? What's going on here? And what we came to see through that doctrine is there is the Father. And it's patriarchal language because that's the way they thought 2,000, 1,000 years ago. So let's just change the language a little. You've got the Father, or we could equally say the Mother today. But what we're talking about is the source. We've got the Son or Daughter, which is the expression of the source. And then we've got the Holy Spirit. Now, the word spirit is just an ancient word for consciousness or knowing. We talk about um, someone who's got spirit. We say uh, a young daughter is spirited. We say a horse is spirited. It's an aliveness, an awakeness. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about what man knows, the things of a man or a human being, except the spirit that's in him, and then it talks about the spirit of God. So there is human consciousness, and then there is divine consciousness, which is what Jesus exemplifies, the Buddha and so forth, and that we're all coming into, which is when our consciousness is raised. Now, there's the Trinity for us. You've got the source, the expression in everything there is, and our personal experience of the divine as us. It's an important doctrine because when I hear some people in New Age walking around saying, I'm God, and I want to say to them, well, yeah, that's true at one level. It is true at one level. You are a manifestation of God, just like a sun ray coming into this window here this morning. Not too many. It's cloudy in Phoenix this morning. But a sun ray coming in here is the sun. It's nothing but the sun. It's only the sun but it's a tiny expression of the sun, not the whole shebang. 
So I think these doctrines are important when they are rightly interpreted in the light of New Age. I think uh, Christians uh, really believe that it's really important that God's a person. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that they believe he's only a person, but some say, oh, no, he's just a flesh and blood person. And yes. others uh, say, well, he's a spirit and he's invisible and he's also a person. But I think that that, you know, that just seems to um, give you the possibility to have a personal relationship. Where, from you know, our point of view, we can't, you know, we can't really uh, relate so much with just a, a knowingness or a source or, a, you know. And somehow, uh, praying to God and talking to God just like he's your brother, uh, somehow is a healing process or some, uh, it, uh, some part of it works, right? I mean, and yes. so let that be, right? <laughs> you know what Sebastian Moore says? He says that God is the most personal reality of all. And the reason that that's the case, and I, I go into this in the second chapter of Your Forgotten Self, the reason that's the case is because God is the heart of our own being. And within that Trinitarian relationship of the whole shebang, the source of the shebang, and my own personal experience of it, it's all highly personal. We're not talking about here just forces. We're not talking either about a human being in the sense of a bodily shape that's limited. Because if in God we live and move and have our being, then we're talking about that consciousness that is the heart of our consciousness, the, the consciousness of a flower, the consciousness of a bird, it's, it's, um, it's what gives source to everything. And that's what we participate in, which is why it feels so personal. It's why we can't be closer to God than we are. And we can certainly talk with God because God is everywhere and everything. We talk about identification and we're identified with, uh, with problems and limitations. But uh, in one sense, if we were alone, how would we ever have gotten an idea that we're less than, less than? I mean, who would we be less than? And so then it seems in a way obvious that that's a cultural phenomena, that somebody is, is trying to say, hey, you could be good like me. And we're saying, well, maybe I could, you know, yeah. <laughs> like that serpent, right? He said, hey, you could be like whoever else was there happened to be God that time. <laughs> Yeah, you see, here they were. They were already the divine image, the image and likeness of God. So in that sense, they are God manifested. And, and now they're told, well, you're not actually yet like God is. You need to become like God is, become wise. So they believe the lie, and that's the essence of original sin, that they were less than they are. I love that piece by Marianne Williamson where she, she talks about that exact thing. Well, you know, what good does it do anybody to think ourselves small in the way that we do? I, I can't quote it right now, but most people know that statement. Uh, Nelson Mandela used it one time, I believe, in his inauguration or something. And, and it, it, it's how we have put ourselves down, seen ourselves as less than we really are. And we are part of the Trinity. We're part of the Christ, and the Holy Spirit is our own personal experience of that consciousness, which is why Jesus called it a comforter, or in better language, a counselor. It's, it's that deep stillness within us that um, guides us, that we share with, that we, that we reflect with and talk with and contemplate with. You mentioned that Michael is uh, reluctant to use the word healing. And yes. uh, so the best, you know, I mean... Uh, we talk to a lot of different kind of people, and a lot of them are, are realizing the essential spaciousness of ourselves and of the whole universe. And, and so one of the best ways to get healed is to realize you're not sick. <laughs> and say, oh. Yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And that's what salvation is. That's exactly what's meant by salvation. You begin to come into your own. Or as Jesus said, you become again like the little child you once were. You came into the world just fully alive, authentic, real in every way. There was no act. There was no, no phoniness. And society inculcates within us this phoniness. That then we have to unlearn. It becomes our identity. And the ego has to be cracked open, which is why Jesus says you have to die and be resurrected. Or what he called be born again. And it is exactly that. If you read Eckhart Tolle's words, I was reading them again just yesterday, uh, of where he describes that morning when he woke up. He says it was if, if he had been born into the world afresh. 
And that's what being born again is. When, when we stop being what our parents, our teachers, society has programmed us to be, and we get, just begin to be our real, authentic self, we, we take a deep breath, we relax, we enjoy, we become authentic in the way a child is, and in that reality, there is a peace and a joy and a connectedness with people that just flows. It's, um, it's, it's like being born again, becoming a new creation. Eckhart walked around his room. He picked up a pen as if he'd never seen it before. He noticed a bird song outside as if he'd never heard it before. And he found that as he walked around the city. That's what Jesus was talking about, not giving your life to Jesus in some tent meeting and saying, I'm born again. He was talking about waking up to who you are, becoming conscious of yourself. So when I said, of course, uh, the best way to heal is to realize you're not sick, I mean, maybe that's fine when it's personal and when it relates to me and when it has to do with my psychological suffering. But uh, it's harder for me to put it on other people because there's a lot of pain in the world. And so then to yes. say that you're not sick, like we, and even the word when uh, a little while ago when we were saying it, uh, the whole process is perfect, and I'm not so sure that's the best word because a lot of people kind of go, uh, you know, perfect. Are you kidding? <laughs> Especially the ones that are really under the gun, you know, with somebody's foot on them and, and that are really suffering in a war zone or in a concentration, you know, not a, a refugee camp, let's call it, and uh, or people in, with great illness. I always feel uh, very uh, reluctant to talk too much about health because I'm so healthy, you know, and I think, what do I know? <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not really putting it on my skin and testing it out. So then I have all these grandiose theories. But how do you relate to people that are really, uh, really know that something is, 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 a, is awry in the world and they're really living right in the center of it? Well, I relate it in a personal way because I've gone through things in my own life that have required... Um, integrating what was going on within me, and then I began to see the change happen in my whole system. But also, when I look at the world situation, you know, there was a block of marble um, that had been passed around from one sculptor to another, and um, they all thought it was the wrong shape, and no one could do anything with it. And then it came into the hands of Michelangelo. And Michelangelo said, I see David. Now, no one else saw David, but Michelangelo began chipping away. When he was chipping away, it didn't look beautiful. And the mess on the floor from all of the marble chipped off. But gradually, there was David, one of the most incredible statues. I, I, I've seen it, and perhaps you have, and, you know, that has ever been carved. And um, I think that when we look at the creation, Paul tells us in Romans 8, he says, the whole creation groans groans and travails in pain. This is like a woman giving birth, which is not a pleasant experience, I'm told. I've had kidney stones a few times, and I'm told it's, it's up on that level for some women. But, um, but afterwards, the joy of coming into what Paul says will be the liberation of the whole creation into the manifestation, the glory of the sons and daughters of God. So I live with hope that every part of the, the, the reason we're going through this long, painful evolutionary process is because God can't create daughters and sons any other way. The only way that the formless, which is God, who's consciousness, can move into form is through this evolutionary process in which the form as the whole, the Christ potential is there in the creation, and then is experienced in me as the Holy Spirit, Holy Divine Consciousness, um, until my life is shaped in the image of God fully in every way. It's a painful, long process, and there doesn't seem to be any way for God to go, there's a new son or daughter. It's just like a child learning to walk. The child has to learn to, to uh, first turn over in its crib. It can't help itself at all. It first can flail its hands and legs. That's it. And eventually it will get where it will roll over. It will then crawl. And eventually it will stand. It's still a long way off running the Olympics. And we are as a creation yet. So there's, it seems to be like, okay, like if there's some attitudes that really feel... Uh, terrible about me or a situation, or if there's some actual physical pain, uh, it's a biological reaction that a certain uh, quite a bit of energy comes up. 
Yes. And I was just thinking, I don't know if there, uh, this exists anywhere. You know, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be great if we, if we knew what to do with that energy? If somehow energy can be transformed into, crea into creation. Because so often we take that energy and, and snap back at what's, what's, uh, what's in front, front of us and we're reacting. So then that's where all comes, uh, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know, what is this vengeance and, and, uh, and vindication? And, uh, and also, you know, like uh, somehow we have to be able to take uh, the, uh, you know, the opportunity. Okay, what's the opportunity? The opportunity, when you say it's all perfect, the opportunity is energy arises. You know, and it kind of takes us out of our, like, our drifting. Like, that, that may be kind of like uh, uh, a, a state with very little energy or just enough, you know. We don't really need it. Uh, we don't call on it uh, when we feel like uh, there's no occasion for it. So then uh, this pain and, uh, and, and these troubles come up and, and the energy comes with it. If we had a way, because if we just say that energy is wasted or that's just eating away at us or it's killing us but if we had a way to take that energy and transform it and make it into creation and create you know create whatever is necessary so that that's not so that uh, that's not happening anymore you know that uh, how could we do which is, that which is why Michael Brown doesn't like to use the word healing but prefers integration um, because we're not trying to get rid of something what we're trying to do is incorporate that which has been stuck. Um, much illness, we now know, is coming from emotional roots. And uh, not all, of course. But um, when, we are, when we are shut down to a part of ourselves through that original sin condition of growing up in a world that teaches us not to be who we really are, Parts of us get shut down. We clamp down. We've, I mean, we do it physically. What happens when someone says something awful? We, we hold our breath. We tighten things. We, uh, we clench. Or if we get mad, we, you know. Um, so there's this clenching that goes on in the body that stops the free flowing of energy. And we grow up clenched. We grow up with tight shoulders and tight voice and neck and so many aspects of us that have been uh, affected in various anxious ways. Well, in a way, well, that's Mike what I'm saying, you know, that's what I'm saying, because like, okay, that, let's say that clenching is an energy. And, what, and uh, many of us are taught we should not have that energy and how, somehow let it go and, and, and get rid of it and, and get into another situation where that energy doesn't come up. Yeah, you know? we don't want to do that. We meet other people, see, uh, that are, are not going to give us that clench. But yeah, I'm we saying, don't want to do that. can't we transform that clench? Exactly. That's what the presence process is. It's to realize that whatever is happening in your life right now isn't something for you to run from and to get out of your life. It's to realize it's required. It's required. Because it's, it, it's a mirror. This is an amazing thing how this presence process works. But it's a mirror of what in me is yet unintegrated. And I have found in my own life, it, it doesn't matter how many divorces you go through, how many different girlfriends, boyfriends, you are going to walk right back into situations that may look totally different, but you are going to walk back into the same dynamics in your personal life, in your job, in all those areas of life that have a way to reflect back to us what we're not seeing. It's as if our inner being makes the entire outward reality like a play that's um, writ large, who we, what's going on inside us. Say a little bit more about integrated. Does that mean accepted, fully accepted, somehow uh, that we're yes. just comfortable with it and uh, uh, we forgive yes. ourselves what for I do it? Or is... life, when discomfort arises is I sit with it and I use what Michael calls um, connected breathing. And that is where the breathing simply has no pauses between the in-breath and the out-breath. I breathe through the nose, just the nose, in and out. And, um, and I use the words that Michael gives in the presence process. With each breath, I am here now in this. So on the in-breath, I am here now in this. There's nothing forced about it. It's natural breathing, but... Like a dog and cat, if you watch them in their natural state, they don't pause all the time. They don't stop breathing between their breaths. So this is just...
and this I am here now in this. That's just what I use because I found what Michael has given us here very helpful. There are other methods a person can use, uh, different kinds of breathing, mantras, and so forth. But what the key thing is to sit with the feeling. So let's say someone says or does something that really starts to get my goat and I'm beginning to react. I can, as I become conscious, I, consciousness doesn't turn us into saints. It doesn't do it for us. It enlightens us. Enlightenment doesn't mean I'm a saint in the way people think you'll just always be sweetness and light. What it means is I can see, I'm enlightened, I'm conscious of what's going on. So now as someone says or does something, and I begin to feel the tightening, the anger, whatever it may be that's arising in me, or the sadness, the disappointment, the desire to distance myself or to lash out, whatever kind of reaction. Now, an enlightened person, they can see the light has gone on. Ah, I feel this separation beginning to happen in me between me and this person, and I'm wanting to push them away. Instead of doing that, I now choose to sit with that and breathe. And as I do so, I find that that energy begins to settle down and it begins to be integrated. And the more I practice settling myself down in that way, the more that energy doesn't flow in that reaction anymore. It takes a little practice. It doesn't happen overnight. And then what happens is that energy has now become useful to me. The things that used to trap me now become my strong points. And I can use that energy in creative ways. That's emotional integration. When I when I visualize that process working, I you know I I, uh, I feel that the things that occur to you, that oh now I'm in some kind of reaction, they're probably pretty strong reactions. Yes. Because. During the day, so many things are happening we're reacting to, but they're kind of like, you know, oh, yeah, more of that. Okay, okay. It's not really a big deal, and we don't notice it, see? And so then how do we notice that we're in continually in, re in reaction? So that the, the times we do notice it is probably severe. And so then those might be the harder times to uh, integrate. And, uh, we lose it. Yeah. And the other times when we're not aware, it would have been easy to integrate, but uh, we weren't aware. <laughs> you know, we weren't really noticing that this is a reaction too. And is there any this hints is the about how, is there any hints about how to, uh, how to start noticing? This is the marvelous um, process of how this happens. Uh, before I became editorial director for Namaste Publishing, I wrote a short book that you can get on Amazon.com called Alligators in Evening Dress. And um, it's what we are. We're, we're ready to react to the least thing. But what happens is, as we notice our reactions, we begin, begin to see how the triggers come along. And it starts with the big things. Yes, we lose it. And it may be some weeks later at first when we say, you know, three weeks ago when I did such and such, I had totally lost my mind. I was beside myself. Just listen at the language we use. I was beside myself with anger. In other words, I have become what Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body, which is almost like a separate reality. It, the ancient word that was used uh, for this was being demon-possessed. It's, it's not some spirit being. It's a consciousness. It's where I, am, I, I have become conscious only of what that person did and have lost perspective. I've lost myself, we say. I lost myself in anger. and uh, All of these expressions. So... What we need to do is, what the vernacular said, cool off a bit. And as we cool off and we begin to become still, we can see, okay, here's what they said, here's what I said, this is how it escalated, what a darn fool I've made of myself. Now, there's the realization. Nothing wrong in all of that. This is the process of how we grow. There's nothing more or less perfect about that than there is about the child who is trying to stand up and take its first step falling down. It's going to fall down again and again and again. Now, if we vent emotional reactions, they get stronger. And I learned this from personal experience. I went through forms of primal scream therapy um, 30 years ago, lots of other kinds of therapy, talk therapy and so forth. And I found they didn't change a darn thing. Um, all that happened is I got more angry. The more I vented the anger at my dad for what he this, that, and the other when I was a kid, the more angry I became. 
So then I began to understand that the model is wrong. We're not volcanoes waiting to explode. We are muscles that are getting exercised. And every time we lose our temper or become sad or whatever it may be, that's some reaction, it's like exercising a muscle. When we sit with that reaction and just allow it to be there, first we're going to see it a few weeks later, then we'll see it a day or two later, eventually we realize it no sooner have we reacted and we close the gap. I explain this in Alligators in Evening Dress, how it happens. We close the gap and eventually, while you're still reacting, you suddenly become aware, enlightened, conscious. You suddenly are aware, oh, wait a minute, I'm reacting. Now you, can, you, you may not be able to stop yourself at first, but eventually you will. It won't be too long as you become more enlightened to how this functions within you. It won't be too long before you can see the provocation coming a mile off. And you can still yourself and breathe through it. And so unless someone is physically violent to us and harming us, I now see them as the messenger, as Michael calls it in the presence process. And he says, don't shoot the messenger. These people have come into our lives to show us that in us which isn't yet integrated. And in First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and verses 17 and 18, uh, Paul talks about if we look into the face of Jesus, it, if we look into a mirror and we behold our face, what we're seeing is the Christ potentiality that we saw in Jesus. And we are being changed from glory to glory. Now, this is the process of enlightenment. I want to see the areas where I'm not true to myself, and then I begin to see what my true self is. And now in any given moment, I know that my true self no longer shoves and pushes or reacts with anger or is nasty to people and all of that. I'm just able to, oh, I see that. I see that for what it is. This person's hurting right now, and I don't react. I'm not saying I do this perfectly, <laughs> not at all. I'm saying I am so far down the road from where I was 5, 10, 15 years ago that it's a journey. I see uh, your explanation is very clear about how first it, it might take a week or something. You realize back then I was, you know, the, the noticing and the, and, the, and the reacting get closer and closer together until they overlap. And then, of course, you know, when you're saying you need to integrate or, or you could integrate, that's the opportunity. Uh, what's the a choice? Yeah, what's the nature of the separation? And the nature of the separation is some uh, some judgment that says that's you know that should be down, that should be suppressed. I shouldn't be doing that, or somehow non self acceptance uh, because otherwise Actually, why would you why would you separate from it? I mean, well the pain. Okay, you say I don't want, you you just feel like I don't want pain, right? so you'd separate from the pain. But and I mean, actually, that's the piece yeah. about the mirror, about looking in the face of Jesus when, uh, or, or the Christ when we look in our own mirror. Because there is something about us knows this is who we really are. We know we are not this angry person. That's why we say I'm beside myself today or I'm not myself today. We know. We know when we're on, on target and we know when we're not. And that's the issue of sin. The word sin just means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. You shoot at the bullseye and you miss. So when I'm not being true to myself, I know I'm not being true to myself. I can feel it. Now, what sets up at that point is something that's going to surprise just about everyone who's watching this, I suppose. And that is what sets up at that time is a feeling of shame. And that's healthy. And the whole Bradshaw thing got shame the opposite to the way it is. Shame, being shamed by our parents and all that, that's all really guilt. Guilt is a very unhealthy feeling in all areas. This is too much to go into right now, but there is a new book coming out probably before the end of the year from Namaste Publishing that's going to be called Journey to Higher Consciousness. And it has a couple of chapters in it that we've just been putting the, the final touches to that explain this difference between guilt and shame. But shame is when I have an awareness of who I am and I blasted this person, maybe in my office, someone said something, you know, and I just blasted them. And I have that feeling, oh my God, that's not me. That's not how I treat someone. And I go to them and I say, I am so sorry I did that. That's perfect. So that's the shame. That answers my question exactly, because my question was, uh, is there a time when you don't make that separation, where you don't need to integrate? And uh, when you realize that shame is a sham, 
you know, that it's not really you, that it was lay, yep. it's an overlay, then I suppose you don't even care. And then you're, uh, you are, you know, like the conscious breathing and I am with this, uh, is, ha uh, is you're always with it because there's nowhere, yes. there's no shame and nowhere to go. And, uh, and, and I think I can say now, Richard, that in my own life, in this last few years, that I have largely moved into the place where I'm okay with being the blunt, crass um, Yorkshireman who's too outspoken and all of these things, and I don't feel bad for being that way anymore. Do I one day think that perhaps I will be a little more, um, a, a little more courteous and winsome in the way I talk with people? It would be nice if that happens, but I don't feel bad for being where I am anymore. I'm okay with being a being in evolutionary process. Maybe that's a, a you know that that comes with the territory of our career because you 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 know a career is already focusing on getting something done right and so then yeah. I mean when I retired I got a lot less crass because there was nothing to really I really didn't need to go beyond anyone or didn't need to have people you know get out of my way I got to finish this by five o'clock you know yeah. Uh, yeah I got a few appointments but uh, what you know, I, I guess I wanted to ask you know like okay we're saying the dissolution of shame. Is uh, is kind of a like a big step, and I'm I was just wondering, maybe I'm just uh, uh, you know, hypothetically, could that happen in just a flash? In other words, because that maybe that's an enlightenment moment when, uh, or is that always a gradual process? I would think that for Eckhart Tolle, from all I know, uh, it happened as a flash, uh, but probably there have been well, we know there was a huge build up to that in his life, um, in my own life. Nothing has happened as a flash other than a flash of anger and that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, uh, it's been a very slow and frankly most of it painful, but now not painful anymore. Now I welcome it. I say bring it on. In fact, whenever I interact, I was with some friends in uh, Palm Springs this past weekend, and whenever I interact with people, I find I've become very conscious now of when I said things that weren't just the way I might want to say them and so forth. And, and I feel that dissonance in myself, but I don't feel bad about it. I just see it for what it is. And that's the process of what the Greek word metanoia, uh, which is transformation. It got horribly translated as repentance. That's an awful translation. It's not what it means. Metanoia is just transformation. And it's that transformation that's in, oh, I said that. That's not who I really am. And then there is the movement beyond it. So that's an issue, sounds like an issue from the Bible, because repentance is, uh, is, is said a lot in the Bible, and I think uh, that part of the, you know, the New Testament is, was in Greek, wasn't it? Yes. And they, they translated metanoia all wrong. It's, <laughs> that's groveling, horrible. You know, there isn't a God who wants us to grovel. There is a God who wants us to love who we are. Why does God love human beings? People think, well, because we're so pitiful and so worthless and God just deigns to love us. That is so much ego. That is bull. That is nothing about what God is really like. God loves us because we are infinitely lovable. And the problem is we haven't seen that about ourselves. And that's what Jesus reveals to us. That's why I wrote Your Forgotten Self mirrored in Jesus the Christ. That is gorgeous that uh, we could just uh, be, uh, now it's time to express it, right? To be totally, yeah. infinitely lovable. Yes. I, like, I like it. I really there is like a place it. where I, I really got my eyes opened on this by uh, Sebastian Moore, a place in his book, uh, Let This Mind Be In You, uh, from Oedipus Rex to Christ, I think it's uh, subtitled. And... Um, Sebastian, I think most of this is in your forgotten self anyway. It's, it's perhaps more accessible in easier language. Um, but he talks about his end. He came as a monk to wake up to the fact that he had an endlessly apologized for self. <laughs> that was me. Endlessly apologized for. All day, every day. When that goes, the pain body goes, the emotional charge goes, and you just begin to relax and enjoy life. Now you move from deficit-based, which is always trying to fix something, into asset-based. I got those terms from Dr. David Snarch, who wrote the book Passionate Marriage and the more recent one, Intimacy and Desire. And this is a man who understands the true self and the false self 
And um, really, if anyone's interested in marriage and sexuality from an enlightened point of view, these are the only books I know that truly give you that uh, passionate marriage and intimacy and desire. But he talks about the difference between being deficit-based and asset-based. There kind of came a point in my life in the last few years at which uh, forget all the deficit stuff. I'm tired of trying to fix this and that about myself. Come into just being okay with yourself as an involving all the marble being chipped off David, you know, <laughs> by Michelangelo, in this case by the yeah. source. That's and a great way to put it, asset-based, because I was always trying to say neediness and wholeness. And wholeness seems like a big jump. How could I be whole? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I am God and all that. I'm whole. But just asset-based, just focus on, on uh, what's working, you know, and, yeah. and uh, I think that really works. I'm whole. Yeah. Sometimes I'm wholly wonderful and sometimes a whole mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so much fun speaking with you because, you, uh, you know, because of your experience at Namaste, because you have, uh, like, all, you know what's coming and uh, you, can, you can tell us. And you have a real good uh, view of all the different uh, literature that you guys have published. And, uh, and so some of us have more sporadic or we jumped around. We don't, we don't really realize what people are saying. And, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to realize by talking with people. And uh, so you're, a, you're, you're one of our terrific assets. <laughs> well, I'm just a person who's privileged to do what I love doing, which is editing and writing. And I get to, I get to edit the books of, you know, uh, that very small selection, but uniquely carefully chosen. Uh, Namaste is not a commercial book house in the sense of wanting to put out more and more books. We, we, we select only those few um, that we really think add to the Enlightenment journey. And so I was privileged to edit the, the um, revised version of the Presence Process and uh, then to be the voice of the Presence Process uh, for Michael um, in the audio version. I can see why he, he preferred me to do it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a grueling task. And I think when you're doing your own work, it's not so easy to do on something like that. For me, it was a huge privilege to record that. And then I also did, as well as Your Forgotten Self, I did this, which is a, a, an audio book, Lessons in Loving, A Journey into the Heart. And that's five CDs. It's about seven hours. And that's only available from namastepublishing.com. Well, I thank you very much, David. You're uh, you're you are a real asset, and uh, let's let's stay in touch. I'm very pleased Love to speak to with talk you. To you. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. David Ord. And thank you, everyone, for for coming and listening to this episode. And uh, keep coming around. We'll we'll talk more with David, or we'll we'll find someone that equally as good, uh, another asset. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all, and. Uh, and we're counting on you to keep showing up because that's the real motivation for the whole whole show. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>